Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, The Strand. Thank you especially to Sayu Bojwani and the New Press for um, the honor of allowing me to talk to you about this incredibly exciting new book and, and, and not just the book, but uh, the larger picture that, that you shine a light on. Um, it's so, so thrilling to, to be here in conversation about people like us. Yeah, well, I want to say all those same things. Thank <laughs> you for being here. Thank you for braving the weather. Um, and thank you to Anthony for um, digging me up out of, uh, we've known each other for a long time, um, but he sort of, this is what happens. You post on social media that you're going to write a book and then someone pays attention. Um, so this is our first New York City event. Um, and it's really meaningful to me to be doing it with such an important organization. Um, and it's really exciting to be doing it in partnership with you, Naomi. So Thank you so much. So I have so many questions. I was so fired up um, going through the book and, and understanding your really powerful, perceptive uh, introduction that kind of takes the reader through the hand, by the hand, through this, um, you know, really transformational possible change that this book documents. So um, I'm just going to plunge right in. Okay. Uh, this is your first book, which is also super exciting, right? After everybody you know, keeps saying first book, like there's going to be others. But well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> you know, why not? Um, and so I, I guess it's it's kind of a, a a dumb first question, but urgent. Why why this? Why now? <laughs> you know, let me give you the somewhat facetious answer first, although it's really true, is um, I really wanted to write a book for a very long time. I've wanted to write a book, and there are about four book ideas that I had, uh, and it was early 2016, and I thought, I have to write this book, mm -hmm. this first book, and in some ways, this was the easy book to write. And it was easy because it's so connected to the work that we do at New American Leaders, in terms of training people to run for office. Uh, and so that was why I picked this particular topic for myself uh, in the moment that I was in. But more broadly, uh, and we were talking about this a little earlier, that I think when we hear about immigrants, we often hear about them as contributors to economy, sometimes as takers from uh, government services. There's very rarely a conversation about what immigrants bring to public life and to our democracy. And I talk about this in the book, and some of you may have heard me say this, that I do feel that we are the most optimistic about American democracy, that many of us- We immigrants? We immigrants. Uh, many of us come from places that don't have democratic governments. Uh, many of us come when we're young and haven't, like in my case, haven't actually been able to vote in our home countries. And um, even right now, when things seem like doom and gloom, um, at least at the national level, at the local level, people are still very energized. So I really wanted to capture that optimism and hope that immigrants feel about this country that they have made home. And the second thing I'll say is that I wanted to also really lift up that the problem is not us. The problem is the system. And by us, do you mean Americans or I immigrants? Mean, regular everyday Americans, that the problem is a system. The problem is that this is a system that was never meant to work for people like us. And in telling these stories, I'm telling stories of hope, but also of systemic obstacles to political newcomers. I mean, you've said, you've said so much, and, and it's a fantastic intro. Just for those of you who are wondering how this book is structured and how it relates to New American Leaders, which is this unbelievably exciting organization that um, Sayu founded, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 the stories of some of the people you, you trained and helped to get elected are in this book. Isn't that right? That's right. And it's organized around what I call these systemic obstacles, right? So can money and politics. Can you speak up a tiny bit? And can you guys hear us? You hear us fine? Okay. Um, I think when, when you think about money and politics, for example, I could give you a whole introduction to campaign finance reform, but that's not very interesting, right? And so what I do in talking about money and politics, I tell the stories of two legislators, now legislators in Arizona, uh, Isela Blanc and Athena Salman, and talk about how they ran for office by using the Clean Elections Program in Arizona, which helps fund candidates' campaigns in similar ways to what we have here in New York City. And so every chapter is a set of stories about one or two people who've run, um, and it helps to illustrate a problem in our system. Like, if we didn't have public financing, then these women would never have been able to run and win. 
And, and may I say, as a writer and a reader, thank God for that approach, because <laughs> seriously, the death of so many well-intentioned books from the progressive side of the universe is that they're, they're written in jargony jargon for mm -hmm. peers, and that ke keeps these very important messages, in my view, from getting out there. So telling right. stories is something your opposition does all the time, yeah. and they do it really well, so thank you for these wonderful stories that you tell. So this brings me to push a little bit, um, or, or maybe ask for a little bit of illumination. I really empathize, uh, and, and I'm excited about your highlighting the obstacles. Um, it, one reason I wanted to really do everything possible to be here tonight and support your book is that I wrote a book called Give Me Liberty um, in 2009 or something, in which I tried to use democracy and like, maybe I'll run for Senate, maybe I'll give a speech in Union Square. And I, I found, you know, I went right up smack up against yeah. these obstacles that are like literally structurally set there in order to exclude people. Mm -hmm. And so your book does an amazing job giving us like the big picture view instead of just like, you know, Naomi stubbing her toe on, you know, if I have a bake sale, I'll get arrested because of, you know, campaign right. finance law. So, um, but here's my question. These obstacles are universal. Like, I found them, and I'm a white woman who lives in the West Village who was born in the United States. Yeah. So how, are these a problem about American democracy, or is there something unique to the experience of immigrants that, that intensifies these problems? No, I think that's a great question, and I was very intentional in thinking about what I wanted to talk about. Um, so that it would relate to everyday Americans. So I think the obstacles are indeed a challenge for anybody who's not a wealthy, white, well-connected male. And it's my intention to lift up those obstacles so that people can stop blaming themselves for not being able to succeed at politics or, and or to see an alternative way to succeed. Um, but having said that, I do think that for immigrants, you know, I don't know about your family story, but I can tell you that in my, in, in my family story, um, we did not sit around the dinner table and talk about American politics. We did not sit around the dinner table and talk about going to vote, um, because that is not, either that it wasn't familiar to my parents, um, they were concerned about economic survival, et cetera. So one of the advantages that you do have as native born, and, and you can be, uh, native born to immigrant parents is the ability to access some knowledge about the political system. So that's different. Um, also, you are not constantly, um, I don't mean you necessarily, but people of color are constantly being told that they don't belong and they're lesser than. And so if you're gonna put yourself in the public arena against all these obstacles, and you also have psych internal psychological barriers, which I agree are not unique to immigrants and refugees, um, I, but I do think it creates an added layer of, of complication and stress. I, I hear you. Doesn't it also create, a, in some ways, a built-in constituency in certain parts of the I country? I think it depends on how you run your campaign, right? So we're hearing a lot about the expansion of the electorate. We're hearing a lot about voters hearing from candidates, um, voters who have never before heard from candidates. So it creates a constituency, um, but the constituency only responds if the person who's knocking on their door, or who's asking for their vote, is someone that they feel connected to because they're gonna represent their interests in Congress or in the state legislature. I, I hear you, I mean, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that um, the grassroots support, and as you said earlier when we were talking before this event started, um, people, once they connect with a candidate and they see their values reflected in the candidate's mm -hmm. platform, uh, count country of origin or uh, ethnicity becomes less important. That was right. what you had said. Yes. So what I'm, I'm thinking, and, and I wonder if your stories in this book bear this out, is that it's on the other side of um, how you mobilize power, those networks, those powerful networks, those donors, those, um, the old boy networks that, you know, the, 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 the people a phone, a phone call away that also disadvantages your candidates materially and that being an immigrant 
it's not that they're disadvantaged because they're immigrants specifically there, but because they're immigrants, they don't, by definition, do, you know, haven't had time to amass, aren't part of, aren't born into those networks. Well, and that's one reason. And then the other reason is that we tend to, I mean, all of us tend to gravitate towards people we know. So if the power structure doesn't look like people in this room, uh, it's unlikely that they're going to bring people into this room, into that power structure. So you're always on the outside. Um, I, I'll say, you know, in 2016, when uh, most of the people in this book, most of the people I write about, in fact, all the people I write about were elected uh, in 2016 or before. Now, some of them are running for re-election. So, you know, we're talking a lot about a wave of candidates, but these ripples were beginning long before this big surge that we're seeing. And in 2016, I remember uh, that a couple of newly elected folks asked me um, what suggestions I had for them to engage with the Democratic Party or to get the Democratic Party's attention. And my response to that was, you know, you just need to build your own power. Because as long as we are standing on the outside asking to enter, uh, there is a sense of dismissing us because mm -hmm. You know, you have to share your power with us. And, but once we start to amass, like this has happened year, year, I mean, election after election this year. Every time somebody who has been dismissed by the party establishment wins an election, they suddenly become the person that everyone's paying attention to. Um, and that's because we have to prove ourselves first before we're let in, which is an unfortunate reality. Really, it sounds like chicken and eggs. So this yes. brings me to the next um, concrete question, which is you've identified, and I, I love it, I love the approach uh, analytically, um, that the book is structured around hurdles. What are the key hurdles that, you know, mo what's the theme of hurdles that emerges in your view that your, your candidates um, kept running into consistently? I think the most striking theme to me, and remember, I'm, I was talking to all these people after they were already in office. So they had already run and won. And still, there was a deep, deep sense of insecurity about whether they, it's not whether they were qualified or whether they had a right, but a deep sense of insecurity about assuming this position of power. Uh, and a deep sense of insecurity about whether they were going to, deep sense of confusion about whether they were going to stay, what it would take to stay, what the costs were on their family. And I found that to be particularly striking, even though it's not a systemic obstacle. But in some ways, it is a systemic obstacle because it's very much connected to the systemic racism, the institutionalized racism that they were facing. So I tell the story of um, these, one of the stories I tell is about Carmen Mendez, who's a city council member in Yakima, and the year that she got elected in Yakima, Washington, she got elected with two other Latinas. And one of the things that she says is that she had to specifically ask their assigned seats in the council, and she asked for the three of them to be separated in their assigned seating. Mm -hmm. Because so often, uh, Carmen, Dulce, and Avina, who were the three who got elected, would be mistaken for each other. God. You know, quote unquote, mistaken for each other. And so when you have those experiences on a regular basis, it's hard to feel worthy of this position of leadership. And was that gendered? Did you find that women um, had those inner qualms more than men did? Um, I think it was different for the men. I think for the men it was, um, I think there was still concern about, you know, were they getting, for, for a number of the men I talked to, there wasn't always um, unequivocal family support. I mean, that was the case for the women too. But all these different things really result in the same end, which is you don't feel quite right. Um, you don't look like the other people who have been in power. Your family is concerned about you. Um, you constantly have to deal with, um, with implicit bias in the way that things are being run. And then the other thing I will say is the, the issue of money. When we think about money in politics, we often think about it as the cost of campaigns, right? But the way that money plays out in the lives of so many of the people I talk about is... Um, it's so intricately woven in everything. It's, do I have enough money to be able 
to buy myself suits to go to these events that I have to go to? Wow. Do I have enough money to pay for gas to be on the campaign trail? Oh, wow. I mean, it's everything, you know? And so, uh, do uh, this isn't specifically in the book, but you've created this beautiful organization that addresses the issues you identify in the book. Do Does your training of candidates address those concerns? How, how, what would you advise a young woman uh, who's an immigrant or a young woman of color who, or a young man of color who might want to run for office or a young man who's an immigrant to, who's apprehensive about mm -hmm. maybe those hurdles in his or her own life? Well, some of those things, um, you know, there's, there's a way that our training talks about the immigrant story as part of the broader American narrative and that a significant component of preparing people to tell their story uh, and to communicate it to voters emphasizes how much the immigrant story is part of the broader American narrative and that people shouldn't run away from that. Um, we talk about expanding the electorate and we talk about money very explicitly and how many of us um, not just immigrants, but many of, money is a very shameful and loaded thing for many of us, right? And so we actively, I don't know that there, there are many campaign trainings where people tell their money story and how their family dealt with money. But then I think... So important. The, the thing is that some stuff is really very, very real. And if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. If you have a mortgage and you have student debt and you're going to go to the state legislature and make $18,000 a year... It's, and you don't know how you're going to balance that, or how you're going to uh, support that additional income that you need, then it may not be the right time. Well, this is a great transitional question then, because I can imagine you know, a state bill, and it's exciting to me that you're working at a state and local level, because that you know, Daily Clout, this company that I run, uh, that you so kindly mentioned, um, we've found that people can make huge differences in legislation at right. a state level that they really can't at a federal level, obviously, but you, you know, we didn't know until we saw it happen again and again that it really doesn't take a lot of you know, tweets to a state legislator with a bill to mm -hmm. scare that person in, or reward that person into action. And um, so I guess the question is, I can imagine a bill being passed at a state level to give a living wage to right. legislators. Are you seeing different kinds of legislation come out of these uh, elected officials with these different backgrounds? Well, no one wants to pay their legislators more money. I mean, that, there is a public opinion problem with that. So I think, um, I think we're going to need to go through a bit of a culture shift for that. And, and one of the things that I think we can make a strong argument for is that it reduces, it could potentially reduce some ethics concerns, right? If you are in the state legislature and it's a full, and we did this in New York, right? They increased the city council salary um, to what seems like an outrageous amount outside of New York City, but it's $145,000. But the stipulation is that you couldn't take jobs outside of the city. So I think that the ethics argument is probably the strongest argument, but we, American people are struggling with their own bills and their own finances, and they, I think that there is an image, right, that our legislators are living right. the high life. Then maybe that's not such a great example for the question, but let me ask it more broadly. Um, like why, okay, d don't get mad, but this was a question that was asked of, of me 20 years ago about feminism. If women are just gonna be elected and pass exactly the same kind of warmongering, you know, social inequality kinds of, bills that men have passed, why elect women? So is there a difference, let me put it to you, in the kinds of bills that these elected officials pass? Uh, are they better? Are they, do they do yeah. more for social justice? Are they more innovative? Is there a value to being an immigrant once you're in elected office? Is there a value to the rest of society in terms of the work product? Yeah, well, I think that last part of your question um, because you said, you know, is there a value to the rest of society? And I think it's really important to, I mean, I should say that both from where I stand and where the organization stands and certainly from where the book stands, these folks are running and winning not on the basis of the immigrant vote, and they're running and, and they're governing for their constituents, right? So the bills that they're passing are bills that benefit 
everyday Americans that benefit women, that benefit people of color. They are not specifically targeted at immigrants all the time. Totally. And I know but that are they good bills? Yeah, are they of better than I mean, their a, 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 an alternative cohort that right. is not? made up of immigrants. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that the fact of the matter is that if you are someone who has had to struggle to pay college tuition, when there is a bill on the floor where they're talking about raising college tuition in state universities, you have a set of experiences that you can bring to that vote. Um, in Arizona, the best example I have of this in recent times, uh, even after the book was, was written, is that in Arizona, these two legislators I talked about were instrumental in ensuring that teachers had access to the state capital when the education reform, I, the, the sort of teacher pay issue was being addressed. So I think their voices matter. Um, I also don't want to dismiss the point that you made about a bill to increase legislator salaries, because I think, I mean, I talk about it in the book, I think it's a, the right Very idea. Important. It's just that it's not where people are, right? They don't want to increase their legislative but, but some of that is how do you tell the story, right? right? If it's a bunch of fat cats anyway, of course you don't want to give them more money. Exactly. But if it's like this makes the difference yeah. where this you know, single mother who's working two jobs can actually represent her community, uh, that's a different story, right? right? right. Um, well, let me go on to the hot button issue that immigration is today because I think that's one reason you know, your book is so valuable and, and why your organization is so valuable. Uh, you know, uh, let's not mince words, the issue of immigration in America is being hotly demagogued. It is a, a piece of political football. We see it all the time. I, when you were speaking, I was thinking of a candidate that Daily Clout, my democracy platform, showcased, uh, who challenged um, Carolyn Maloney. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Suraj Patel, and there was a wolf whistle comment, and he did really well, you know? Yeah. Uh, and there was a wolf whistle comment um, that someone from the establishment who opposed him said most of his donations came from people with nat last, the last names of Patel. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't like, if you translate that, and I'm Jewish, so I can say this, if you translate that to, well, they're supported by people named Cohen, y you know how racist that sentence right. is. Um, talk about the, the way immigration is being demagogued politically and whether these people you showcase um, are, are an answer to that yeah. or a response to that. Um, so, so much there. Um, I think that we can't even say that this is an unprecedented time in American history in terms of the demagoguing of immigrants, right? Because it is particularly bad, but those of us who, um, I mean, Anthony talked about me being commissioner. When I was commissioner of immigrant affairs, it was six months after September 11 in New York City, oh God. which is a progressive city. Um, I served in the Bloomberg administration. Um, it was very hard to get people who were in appointed city positions to understand what it meant to be a person of Muslim, Arab American, South Asian background, walking through airports, walking through the streets. Um, immigrants have always been a political football. What we're seeing now is an unprecedented attack on every level. Um, and I think the pushback from people like the ones in this book and we saw a, a doubling of the number of applicants right after the 2016 election wow. for, because what we're saying now, I think this phase of the immigrant rights movement is, you know, we are sick and tired of this. We're not going away. And not only are we going <laughs> to hide, uh, not only are we not going to hide, but we're also going to show up and we're going to show you that we can have political power. Um, so although we, we I, uh, people like me, immigrants, women of color, uh, represent just about everything that the Trump administration is attacking, we also are his worst nightmare now. I mean, so many more of us are running, running successfully. Um, do I think it's going to fundamentally change the way the system works? Not right away. I think many more, the changes you're going to see are incremental in terms of numbers. So in order for us, there's many, many more of us who need to be, to be running. Um, and I do think that, you know, adding the citizenship question to the census, um, taking away benefits or refusing um, green cards and citizenship to people who have been claiming necessary benefits to feed their families and care for their children, um, is it, it's absolutely going to have an effect, effect on people's daily lives. But I think it's going to make the movement and the fight 
the movement stronger and the fight bigger. Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think we have seen, we have not seen this unprecedented people power, at least not in the time, in the 30 years that I've lived in the United States. Right. I, I totally agree with you. Um, by the way, I, you know, I've been worried for a long time about democracy dying in America and people not noticing. And the one thing I'm relieved about, and I think your book goes right to the heart of it, is uh, people are noticing and taking yeah. action. And there is more activism than I've seen since the 60s. I don't know if right, this right. resonates with um, the, the response that you get. Yeah, and I think it's also a different kind of activism in the sense that I think people are both challenging um, what the administration is doing, but also challenging the systems. Right. They're not okay with, I mean, you've seen this, I bring up the issue of establishment Democrats because it's very easy to vilify the Republican Party. And they're, you know, probably quite deserving of everything that we have to say about them. But on the Democratic side, there has been no pipeline. I mean, you know, on the progressive right. side, we have not built a strong infrastructure of recruiting new people to run. And now that these new people are stepping up, party leaders are often poo-pooing them, your community doesn't vote. Yeah, cetera, what's, what's that about? That seems so suicidal. Yeah. No, I mean it. What is it about? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> power doesn't give up very easily. But if there's no pipeline, they're just going to die off like dinosaurs and there will be nothing left but empty forests. I mean, I think that there is a demographics is destiny um, frame that we What have. do you mean by that? that I've meaning that, that like, we don't have to actively focus on diversity. Oh, because they vote for us anyway. They have yeah, nowhere else to go. they vote for us anyway. And eventually there's going to be so many of us that we're going to get that get that access to the power. And what I say in response to that is that women have been 51% of the population for a very long time. And if we ever need a proof, need proof that demographics is not destiny, we can see that when it comes to women's leadership, right? Like, well, certainly, and you, you raised something that I was gonna ask you about, which is um, Im immigrants don't vote as a block. I mean, we're seeing very interesting dynamics in Florida right now where um, Latin American communities are are voting conservative. You know, yeah. they're not the you know reliable democratic voters that I have heard democratic insiders snooze about. You know, we don't right, have right. to do anything for them because we have them. You know, we don't have to court them. We don't have to win them over. They're stuck with us. Um, is that part of the argument you make to donors and to candidates? Well, it depends on who the donor is. Right, <laughs> um, but. There are two people in this book, um, two stories I tell, uh, both of whom were, uh, they ran as Democrats, but were formerly Republican. Um, and, you know, it's different reasons. Uh, one of them is Sam Park, and he grew up in a Korean American family, and the family was, uh, was Republican, and he lived in the South, lives in the South, um, and they sort of voted along in the same way that most of their neighbors did. And the other story I tell is of Isela Blanc, who was formerly undocumented, who benefited from the um, Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1984, which was signed by Reagan. And so for her, the association with becoming, of having access to documentation in America, her association was with the Republican Party. So I actually think that um, we shouldn't assume that all immigrants are going to vote Democrat. We shouldn't assume that they will continue to vote Democrat. Right. Um, I think we shouldn't take anything for granted ever, actually. Uh, absolutely. And uh, this brings up another interesting question I have for you, which is you're um, referencing immigrants and people of color. Um, and, you know, these are very different histories. I mean, African right, Americans right. obviously didn't immigrate, they were brought here yeah. centuries ago in chains. So, uh, w can you speak about that? Like, why, what, why? <laughs> yeah. I mean, are, is, are you just talking about like a block of the the people who are marginalized? Is, or yes, absolutely. I mean, I in I hope that everyone who has been othered in some way sees themselves in the stories that I tell. Um, it was very intentional to me. Uh, I was very intentional about ensuring that um, this was a book that included. Um, immigrants of all backgrounds from a lot of different states, uh, people who identified with the LGBT community, because I, I think there is that 
shared experience of marginalization. Um, there are also an increasing number of immigrants from African countries in particular. Um, I think we've had always had a lot of Caribbean immigration, but mm -hmm. definitely we've seen an increase in the number of black immigrants uh, signing up for our trainings. Um, but would you, I guess what I'm asking is, do you exclude people who are not actually immigrants, but who are people of color who have lived, you know, whose families have lived yeah. in this country the, for generations? Our training is open to anyone who in some way identifies with the immigrant experience. Um, the training is really about lifting up our stories and running as we are. Um, and we have had African Americans and Caucasians, for example, take mm -hmm. the training. But our target is first and second generation Americans. Gotcha. Um, well, we've covered so much ground, and I don't have a uh, timepiece in front of me, but yeah. I wonder if it is now time to, I'm sure the audience is burning with questions, and we get the thumbs up from the strand that it is time for questions. So I, I let me, this wonderful, Nicholas has a, a handheld mic, and I, I see a lot of very thoughtful faces. People are having thoughts and wanting to say things, and we'd love to hear what, what you have to say about this amazing book and this subject. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is, Sayu, what is your next step? So you've wrote this, uh, you wrote this book. Um, are you working on another one? Sounded like your comment earlier, probably not, but like, what is your next big project that you're working on? Well, I thought, you, I thought it was going to be an easy answer first until you started saying, are you working on another one? Um, well, first, I want to go all, as much as possible around the country to the places um, where people whose stories are in the book um, live uh, and to try to have as much of a conversation pr prior to the midterms as possible about the importance of participating. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of new faces in leadership after the election. Um, and it's not a new project, but I think we're really, as an organization, we're really doubling down on the work that we're doing to support people once they're in office. So thinking more about governance and thinking about how do you, everybody I wrote about was a, is a movement leader, right? And But being a movement leader in office is very different than being a movement leader on the outside. Um, and so really thinking very intentionally about how do we support people so that they stay true to the values that got them there in the first place. I'm wondering, in your researching and writing this book, what did you learn about this topic and these individuals that surprised you? That's a great question. Um, I think that when I first started thinking about the book, I, I didn't have the frame of the systems. I was thinking about different groups of people. You know, I was thinking about whether I would do city-state. and. I learned this in part through the stories and just in part through the research about these very specific systemic things that um, if we don't address them, we're going to keep getting just two or three people elected. The, that if we really want to see a wave, like it feels like a wave now relative to 2016 or 2014, but if we really want to see a wave, we need to dismantle some of the structures. So that was a big lesson for me over the years of running the organization as well. Um, I, you know, I talk some about some of the psychological barriers and I think I heavily weighed those um, and hadn't really accounted for all the systemic obstacles. Hi, um, you mentioned that you think that this generation of immigrants running for office are challenging the structure of government more than previous generations. How do you think the obstacles faced by immigrants running for office now compare to, say, the first generation of Jews running for office or the first generation of Italian Americans running for office? Um, so actually what I, I was saying is that I think the, this generation of people running for office, so it's immigrants, but everyone I think is sort of willing to, more people are willing to buck the party systems and the establishment in the post-2016 wave. Um, I think the big thing, this is, may be an answer to your question, may not. Um, you may not be satisfied with it, but I think we're in a time where, you know, it used to be that we had different groups of people arriving, and so 
it would be, you know, the Italians and the Irish and the Germans, and, and, and each group was being integrated at different times. And now we have this moment where it's like an incredibly diverse group of immigrants uh, from the Asian sub Asian con from from Asia, sorry, and from Central and South America, and then I mentioned immigrants from from some African countries, and I think that there's a negotiation of power um, that is very different, um, and it me and I think I was saying to Naomi earlier that we are in a unique moment in our democracy where we're trying to figure out what does it mean to build an inclusive and multiracial democracy. And no one ever was trying to figure that out, right? It was never like, it's not like the founding father sat around and thought, oh, well, let's see how we're gonna equally distribute power to people, right? <laughs> and so now we're like, okay, you know what? This whole system is not gonna work. And we, we have to become the new founding parents of a democracy that there isn't really a model for. That, and it makes me a little nervous when you say that. What, what do you mean? Because deeply there isn't anything, like, there isn't anything wrong with the structure of our democracy that's different from the parties as long as everyone has access to it. it like, what do you want to read? Well, what do you want to, like, t tear up and start over? You know, not the Constitution well, I'll give you, or I, I'll go back to government. an example of something we talked about. So, um, state legislatures, uh, you know, they, when, when we first thought about state legislatures, it was like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to farm during the harvest season, and then I'm going to go up to the state capital of Montana and be a legislator. Just like when we said, oh, you know what, let's send kids to school um, every part of the year except the harvest season, and now we still have two-month, three-month summers. And so I think, like, if you want a functioning legislature with a full-time salary, that's one thing that doesn't dismantle democracy, but okay, that... Okay, so you're, ta you're talking about reforms right. of the practice. You're not talking yeah. about changing the theory of democracy. No, not the theory. I mean, well, we, that's a whole different conversation. I'm talking about very specific structural challenges yeah. um, that we can address. So how do you feel about the Electoral College? <laughs> that's another conversation, right? That's the next book. How do I feel about the Electoral <laughs> College? No. Funny story about that is someone... Um, I had some, we had someone working at New American Leaders who um, interned for Susan Collins, and um, he said that they got an extraordinary number of calls from people asking where the Electoral College was. So, I mean, I'm just saying. Um, Sayu, it, you know what I, having worked with, uh, you know, ethnic media and community media for so long. A tiny bit so is this, can, can, can you hear me now? Okay. So the one, there's this prevailing narrative about immigrants, you know, that, that, that is narrowed to, you know, the, the undocumented, the unskilled, the people that are, you know, falsely, you know, taking the resources, et cetera. So I am wondering, uh, in a way, it, it, you know, I'm thinking, for instance, about Alexandria Ocasio mm -hmm. and how, you know, she, you know, is this something that one even needs to go and address this narrative to try to change, you know, try to convince people that this is different? Or is it just building within, you know, you know, our ranks as immigrants, et cetera, to just ba basically rise up and and show show the difference? I mean, like the, in New York itself, right? I mean, immigrant communities outpace economically, you know, like by five times what other communities are doing. Uh, you know, the CEOs, you know, like 25% of the CEOs are immigrant. Uh, you know, the medium uh, salary, you know, maybe like, what, 80-something 80 some, 80 thousand dollars. I mean, there's all of, this, all of this stuff that is evident when you look into this thing, but it's not part of the narrative. Yeah. So I feel like every single one of your questions is like an hour-long conversation, but I will say that I... Um, Two things. One is that, you know, I do worry about the good immigrant, bad immigrant fra frame, right? I think that's a very problematic frame. Like, we are human beings. We each have value uh, just because we are. Um, and, uh, yes, you know, I have a doctorate and two masters, but that does not make me a better or stronger or more valuable human being than someone who is... Um, 
you know, who wasn't able to finish high school or, or whatever. So I actually have actively stayed away from that frame whenever I'm conscious of it, because some of it is also that we internalize um, these things. Um, I will, let me tell you just very quickly, you already know this, but for some of you who don't know, when I first started doing work with immigrants, I focused on my community, the South Asian community, or what I felt was my community at the time. Um, I think you all are part of my community. Um, and I did that work one-on-one -on -one with young people, right? Not me personally, but the organization was very specifically focused on young people. That's how I understood that a lot of what they were experiencing was gonna be addressed better through policy reform. And so when the position at the commissioner, as commissioner of immigrant affairs opened up, it made sense that I would make that move. Um, and then when I was in that job, it became very clear to me that no one, literally no one I was talking to understood the immigrant experience. I mean, I, I, I could be forgetting this, but I, I, I was not talking to that many people within city government who were themselves. It, leadership positions within city government, right? Um, and so I felt like I was the lone voice advocating on behalf of my community. And so when I started this organization, and this is kind of a response to your answer, is I thought, well, you know what, I'm not gonna change these people's mind. So why don't we just have the power ourselves? And define what that power looks like for a different America, right? Define that power in a way that is relational and distributive rather than we're up here deciding how government's gonna look so that we can control you. Um, and, and so that's kind of where I've landed on this, like to not get into the economic arguments at all because that hasn't served us. I mean, we've been making that argument for the last 10 years in relation to immigration reform and we didn't get it under Bush, Obama, yeah. and we're not gonna get it now. If anything, I think it reinforces some stereotypes, that yeah. argument, now that I'm listening to you. All right. Hi, uh, so we're here with Literacy Partners, and of course, I, I just wanna encourage everyone sure. to speak up, because you're also <laughs> on live stream. So we're here with Literacy Partners, and of course, everybody thinks of literacy as books and literature and reading. But there's also another type of literacy, uh, like media literacy, um, and just knowing how to find the right resources. So do you have any suggestions for electoral literacy um, or where to, where to find resources on, and I guess uh, the context I'm asking this in is that, you know, growing up I was told, you know, vote, it's National Voters Registration Day, register to vote, but that's all good and well, but half the time I would get to the ballot and know maybe one of those right. groups. So how do you find information on things like that? Um, so I think that it, there's, like, I know I can't, for some reason I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but I know that there's a New York City election site that, that's run through Columbia where you can get information about who's on the ballot, et cetera. Um, I mean, even as someone who is high civic literacy, I always struggle with the judges, right? How many of you get to that ballot and you're like, oh, oh also referendum. Why, referenda, I think, are designed to confuse us. So I do think that even um, people with literacy in English and high civic literacy, um, you know, there's a lot more that could be done, maybe through literacy partners about, um, and then there's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting all my national and New York City stuff confused, Citizens Union, um, there is a site at Columbia. Those are two places that I, I use for information. And then I think people have, um, especially for referenda, for example, there is a bias, right? Like different institutions have different biases. So you really wanna, I rely on the institutions who I feel are values aligned um, to make a decision about whether a referendum, and we're gonna have some referenda on the ballot um, for uh, the, the Charter Revision Commission has recommended um, that you know are supposed to to really expand the electorate and boost democratic participation. How community board appointments are run, um, I know that there's going to be a referendum on that. So I think finding a values aligned organization to get recommendations from, and then um, I can't remember that site, but I'm sure it'll come to me. I, I have to chime in um, because your question is exactly what Daily Clout was yeah. designed to address. So I have to yes, dying to add do. my my you know, 
platform, uh, we create, we're nonpartisan, we create blogs and infographics and cartoons and videos, um, as well as being able to digitally share actual live bills so that you can uh, lobby with your own social media. But we try to be the thing you can check that isn't these, some of these sites are, you know, very great information, but you want to kill yourself by the time you reach the end of them. And so as someone from a news background, you know, we felt like it was important to kind of make it fun, make it easy, make it jump off the page. So um, I hope to add that to your, your toolkit as well. There's a question. Hi, uh, thank you both so much for this conversation. Um, my question has to do with building power among the people that you are talking about in your book and other candidates like them. I think we're seeing with the whole Kavanaugh situation, um, to put it mildly, how toxic the systems of power are that are, have kind of propelled him along and, and sheltered him and sheltered so many people like him within our system. And how do you kind of counter that? Um, and I'm thinking there's so many more good people <laughs> than bad people, right? So like, how do you build power and connection between the kinds of people that you're talking about in your book and the kind, those kinds of candidates? Like, is there do you have an alumni association? Is there kind of Question. coalitional things that happen? Do you, is there support that happens across candidates? I don't know, it's uh, sort yes, of a vague question. to all of those things. Um, you know, when we first started the organization, uh, I thought we would just do these trainings, and then it became very clear that people needed a lot more support. So we have an initial training that we call Ready to Lead, which is, as I said, really targeted at first and second generation Americans. Um, and then folks from that training can get an advanced training. And then when they declare, we Wait, have where a Where is of, it physically? Um, it's in a number of different states. So we're in six states, um, Arizona. Arizona, Michigan, New York, Colorado, I'm sorry, Arizona, New York, Michigan, um, Nevada, and Washington, we added this year, and what am I missing? Somebody, oh, Orange County, California, um, and then we're adding Georgia and Colorado next year. So um, it is, we believe that we need to build those ecosystems locally in part to do what you're saying. So what happens is that we have a state coordinator, they support the alumni, if, if an alum runs, we can't help them, but a lot of the alum volunteer for their campaigns. If an alum runs for state rep and then decides to run for state senate, then that state rep seat can be filled by another alum who, you know, so there is that ecosystem of participation. Also, we have a, a network of elected officials and we support them, as I was saying earlier, in, um, in trying to, a lot of it is not just about here's a policy that you can pass, but here's what you need to do in order to continue to be effective in connecting with the community. Um, and sometimes it's just about creating a space for conversation. But so we do that throughout the year in the state and then we do it once or twice a year nationally. Do you also have like a pool of resources like these are good campaign managers and these are good press people? Well, they meet each other actually on the, through, through the training. Um, and uh, and they tend to work with each other, right? So, it, and so I'm going to nudge you to say the website where someone yep. watching this online can think, well, I want to run. What do I New do? Newamericanleaders.org. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, we have a Facebook page too that you can follow us on, which I think we may already have all the 2019 training dates up, so you can definitely sign up. Um, and I should say that. Does it cost money? It, there's a $150 registration fee for the weekend, uh, but you can apply for a scholarship. very affordable. Yeah. Wow. Okay, everyone who's watching, you heard that. NewAmericanLeaders.org. NewAmericanLeaders.org. Go, don't sit on your butt this time around. You, you know you want to run. You know when you want to lead. You know you want to make decisions about the country. You need to sign up on her site right away and get trained, right? Yeah, and can I just say two or three things you can do right now if you're not even thinking about running is go to your community board meeting and your city council meetings because a lot of stuff gets decided there because no one's watching. People don't even know where to look to find that yeah. information. Like I literally, and they make it, okay, all right, Mayor, Mayor de Blasio, this is aimed at you. You don't even have someone answering the phone in your press office. You don't have a human being. It is a form. And 
Yeah. And so if, you know, if I'm trying to inform people like where to go for my local community board meeting, I can't find out and I'm a journalist. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it's not, that's the thing, it's not meant to be transparent. So if you're showing up, yeah. Um, the trainings, they start usually in late January and run through June um, around the country. Oh, they're, how long are they? They're about every month, a month every three weeks or so. They are in different locations. Um, I, like, I don't know where the New York one is going to be, but um, usually they're at their universities, their uh, community centers, that sort of thing. So can I do another little nudge? Because this is, this is so dear to my heart, getting, getting everyone in the room who wants to run and everyone watching you to, to, to jump in and sign up. If people are sitting here thinking, well, I'm only 21 or I'm 65 or I'm, you know, I have another full-time job, tell, lay to rest some myths people might have that would keep them from signing up, right? I mean, isn't it um, true that there's no such thing as too young as long as you're past a certain age or too old if, as long as you're able to answer the phone, I right? I have one thing to say. What? Our current president. <laughs> I mean, not if, you, <laughs> if you are sitting there thinking that you aren't ready, you're not qualified, you're too young, you're too old, you're too rich, you don't know anything, I mean, also, by the way, I just, this is to my earlier point, um, you know, and I get this a lot. A lot of people come to me and say, oh my God, your job sounds so great. You know, how can I get into the nonprofit sector? So I don't think that everybody needs to run for office. And I certainly don't think you should all quit your jobs and run for office. I think you can join, in New York, you can join your community board. You can how? do this. How? But literally, like how? Like um, break it down. I how think do the do first it? step, I'm a little rusty on the, on the New York City specific stuff, but probably the first step is to check in with your, I think the borough president still appoint. It's a very political process process because community boards decide about businesses they just they get money that they can distribute so it's not easy by the way but I believe that the borough presidents get to appoint someone and where so do you find your borough president sorry to be well, such a nerd but you I'm should know your borough president mm -hmm. but how like how I mean I think you could search Manhattan borough president Queens borough president okay. like really I think that's what you have to do and then you and phone like this is people's fear and I empathize so much this is like literally yeah. why we created daily cloud they call up they say I'm Joe, you know, whatever, and I want to talk to the borough president about joint running for the board, and they're afraid they will never be called back. I'm a best-selling author, and Bill de Blasio didn't call me back, <laughs> or anyone in his press office, you know? And, like, people feel like it's going to be pointless. They right, are, right. If they're not connected, no one will tell them. Yeah. And, no, I, and I that's think real. That's a very legitimate, um, le legitimate issue, and I, I think I wouldn't ask to speak to the borough president. I would just ask to find out what the timeline is for appointments on the community boards. You can also count, call your city but council shouldn't member. shouldn't that be transparent somewhere? May I say something? Yeah, please. Scott Stringer has a website, okay. and he sends out emails to people about who community subscribe boards, right? to him. Okay, Pardon? That's he great. also, I, I have been Thank asked you. by his office about recommendations. And as well board. as the emails that he sends out, he refers to specific issues and asks people to back them. So uh, I think he really makes himself as available as he can. Thank the, you. the website I was mentioning, the, the Columbia one, I think you can put in your address and it tells you who your city council member are, et cetera. And then I would call them all. I'd just but call them all. Can I just say, and, and I am such a nerd about this, and I, I'm sorry, but shouldn't, isn't this public knowledge, like shouldn't there be some damn government website in New York City where I live and you live, where you can just think, you know what, I, I want to sit on, I want to represent my community, I need to find out how to do it. You shouldn't be having to make phone calls and hope someone calls you back, right? This is well, like the dark ages. <laughs> well, no, but it's not meant to be, I mean, this is, you asked this question earlier about like, what can we do to transform things and reform things, and one of them is to work on transparency. Like but how is, is this not transparent processes to, to run because to... Because people put their own... Because first of all, money is involved and power is involved. Mm -hmm. So this is what happens. is A city council member is like, well, I'm going to put this person I know on the community board because then they're going to think like I do or vote like I do or give the money to the places I want to give them. I mean, would, would someone 
use their phone and look up how to run for community board in New York while we're sitting here because this is torturing I think, me. Do you have an answer? We, this is the final question okay. of the evening. Oh, sorry. So I know that I, I did look up mine last week in Brooklyn and for Eric Adams. And if you go to, to just community board in Brooklyn, it actually comes up. I think you can put your zip code in and it'll tell you the community board and the day and time of the meeting. Oh. And it also will tell you, we don't have any, mysteriously, we don't have any committees because that's the challenge with the president of that particular community board. She's not um, staffing any of the um, committees and, and people are calling her on that. But actually in Brooklyn, you can find out you know, the community board yeah. and when they meet, they meet at the Restoration Plaza. And some of that information is pretty transparent. I think in Brooklyn where the it's not transparent it's what's going on and who's on the board and there's a waiting list wow. for people to join the community board and there are no term limits um, as far yeah. as I well, hear. Well that's going to change. Um, I think that's, that's what, the referendum in that's the, the, in referendum. That the Charter Revision yeah. Commission has recommended. So there's like some transparency but I think some of it is also depends on who's been on the community board and how long they've been on it yeah. and right. the control that they have. Right. So it's not always the fault of right. you know, the, the borough president right necessarily it's it's the people who are actually running and have been on for a really right. long time that's really really helpful well what would you say because we're running out of time as a as a kind of closing um you know summary of what you discovered on this journey and what you want everyone out there who's going to read this book and the title of it is people like us I'll and the subtitle is the new wave of candidates knocking on democracy's door it's available on amazon it but it's available at your local independent bookstore as well, and it's available here at the Strand, which is hosting this event, and Literacy Partners has been the wonderful host and supporter of this event. So what's your, like, rousing call to everyone to take up oh. arms for democracy? Don't take anything for granted. And um, do not associate the problems that we're having with, in this political moment, with just one person. That, um, I think that we have, it's too easy to dismiss what's happening as, as the fault of this particular president. Um, and I also think that the last, this is the last thing I will say, because that wasn't really a rousing call, but I do think <laughs> that everyone can do their part. I think you can get someone to vote. I also think that a very, very, very important thing to do is to really engage in people, with people in conversations about why they don't vote. Because I think we tend to want to hang out with other people like us who, um, see what I did there? Other people like us who are already involved and active, but I think it's important to listen to why people feel like they shouldn't participate. I think now you can do many, many, many things before you even run for office find out about your community board, vote, support a candidate who's running, um, go to another state and canvas. This is a big, big year for many, many sure. states. Um, and so there's always something that you can do from the comfort of your own home while you're watching something on television. There's always something that you can do. And so specifically technology for has helped, right? I mean, there are some things. You can, rope, you can call people from your own home. You don't right. have to travel. And for your own organization, New American Leaders, what could someone watching this who really wants to pitch in and help you do? Um, well, I think you should you definitely sign up for our mailing list. Um, it's a way, honestly, I think we are doing the most hopeful work in our country today. Because if you are feeling miserable about what's going on and you go onto our website and you read the story of someone who ran and won for office, it is super inspiring. Um, and so if you do nothing else but you get our emails, we do a resistance roundup every week where we tell you what to stay hopeful about. Hmm. Um, and what you can take action on. And so at a minimum, you can do that. We're always looking for contributions. Um, if you support the book, um, in particular, if you buy it today, I can sign it for you. Um, I encourage you to, um, you know, I want you to buy the book, but I also want you to share the book with others who may not be able to purchase it. Because the best thing that we can do is to talk about democracy all the time and never, ever take for granted what we have in this country. Beautiful. All right.